It's a particular pleasure to welcome our speaker tonight back to Westminster because he was kind enough to speak here about a year, year and a half ago. So he may be known to, to some of the veterans in the room. Um, there are some seats over here. Great. Uh, Mike, Michael Pregent is a former intelligence officer who spent considerable time working malign Iranian influence in Iraq, a subject which you'd be hard to run out of since there's so much of it. He served as an advisor to Iraq's security and intelligence apparatus, included, including an embedded advisory role with then Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's extra, extra constitutional office of the Commander-in-Chief, which it turns out, as we will learn tonight, was set up to ensure Iranian-backed Shia military party control of Iraq's security and political processes. I do remember from uh, when I first had the pleasure of meeting Mike, of hearing a story whether it was this embedded or on another occasion when he's sitting in the room with a group of Iraqis who naturally enough are speaking in Arabic and they get into a sensitive uh, subject area and they said, no, no, wait, who's this guy? We don't want to talk with him. Said, oh, don't worry, he's, a, he's just a stupid American. <laughs> and Mike being... Uh, not only an intelligence professional, but intelligence sat there as if he hadn't understood a word they said, while of course he's completely fluent in Arabic. Um, just a couple quick items aside from those experience, he was also an embedded advisor with the Peshmerga in Mosul in 2005-2006. Um, he served in Desert uh, Shield, in Desert Storm, he was a company commander in Afghanistan. He uh, served as liaison officer in Egypt during the 2000 Intifada, counterinsurgency intelligence officer at CENTCOM. Uh, the, the, the list of his experiences and the background for his deep knowledge goes on. So without further ado, let me uh, ask Mike to come up to talk tonight about after ISIS, the future of Iraq under Iran. Well, first off, I'd like to say there is no after ISIS. ISIS is simply going to ISIS 2.0 or, or going to the Al-Qaeda <laughs> mode. So, and that's one of the things we, we, we caution is this, uh, there's a sense that the administration will declare victory against ISIS in Syria and Iraq and say, we're out of here that we've met our mission, we've met our requirements, and let's leave. <clears throat> so thanks for having me. Thank you very much. It's good to be back here. Uh, the good thing about being back here is I was here in March of 2016 before Mosul, before Fallujah, and warned about what was going to happen. And I have something on my Twitter page. Tw please, if you follow me, don't follow me on Twitter. Go to the Hudson Institute so you can see panels. <laughs> where I actually have an opportunity to say something outside of the constraints of, uh, of Twitter. But I have something up front, it's called the Warner's Dilemma. And I, I don't know where I came up with this. I've looked for it, I've tried to give somebody credit for it, I can't find it anywhere. But I'm happy to give it to somebody else. But it's uh, something that I did as an intelligence officer, is I'm a warnings and indicators guy. Uh, what are the indicators of instability? Uh, what are indicators where <laughs> U.S. foreign policy, if not, if not applied correctly, can actually uh, pour gasoline on a fire, you know, that, that goes against U.S. interests. So if you worry about something and it doesn't happen, critics will say, ha, ah, you were wrong, you don't know what you're talking about, right? And if it happens, you're regrettably right. You don't want to be right. I'm happy to be wrong. And I, I've challenged Baghdad. I had a panel a week and a half ago with the Iraqi deputy chief of mission uh, within two minutes into my into my my talk at the bipartisan policy center, um, basically started saying I was kadab kadab right 
Could I, or could I, my Arabic is terrible, by the way. But I understand 80% of what I'm hearing. I heard enough to say, thank God this dumb Texan's in here and doesn't know what's going on. And uh, I was able to get 300 pieces of paper that turned out to be 300 target packets against Maliki's political opponents and with very weak evidence that said, this guy is a terrorist simply because he's a friend of a person who is a has a known association with somebody who might be a terrorist. That was enough to get people removed. But going back to um, to what I was saying uh, earlier, is that you know you, you can get attacked right away when you, when you say things. And I, I challenged Baghdad. And I challenged the the embassy. I said, show me I'm wrong. Prove prove to me I'm wrong. I'm happy to be wrong. Show me that everything I'm saying is alarmist. Is uh, is not backed by facts, and I'll I'll go. And he said, I will not invite you. I will not invite you here. But then his his aide came up to me afterwards and said, Of course we will invite you. And I said, Yeah, I'll see Kalamsha, you know, handcuffs at the at the airport as soon as I land in Baghdad because it's not a it's not a uh, secret anymore that I'm a former intelligence officer who was working with the Iraqi military and the government as a Mustashar Siasi, a political advisor for General Petraeus and General Ordierno. It's, it's so refreshing to be outside of that community now and not be constrained by clearances, not be constrained by walls without windows, and not to be sitting in a partition with my arms folded upset because I'm not traveling the Middle East to do things that I just made somebody else smart about. So this is great. Uh, one of the best things that's happened since the time we spoke in March 2016 is the Osama bin Laden documents were released. And it shows a clear operational relationship between Iran and Al-Qaeda. Something that I hinted at in March of 2016, but couldn't get into the details. The reason this map is up behind me is this is what Iraq looks like now. It's been updated. But let me just talk you through this, what this map really means. So when we heard the president talk about, he gave a speech on a Friday where he designated the entirety of the Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist entity for supporting a general named Qasem Soleimani of the Quds Force. Within 60 hours, Qasem Soleimani of the Quds Force <laughs> used Shia militias with American equipment to attack an ally, the Kurds, a, an ally we've had for more than a decade, an ally that I've worked, I've, I've worked with, and we've, we've had successes against Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Shia militias, Quds Force. Any adversary in Iraq, the, the Peshmerga, and Kurdish intel have been instrumental in helping us deal with this. Also, also other intel from, from the Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Defense back in the day during the search. But with this map, this is the current situation with the exception of another place. Since I did this map, you can now paint this area in Kirkuk as I use orange just to show where we could rely on Kurdish allies to not only go against ISIS, but to halt IRGC, uh, land bridge operations. Everybody here knows about the land bridge. It's, it's one of the things that President Trump talked about. There's, there's two th key things that came out of the National Security Council uh, two days before the president had his speech. Uh, some of us from think tanks were brought in. Uh, we were briefed. The information was embargoed. And, of course, Friday we learned that the president's main mission is to not only defeat ISIS, but to neutralize destabilizing activities from the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, meaning the Revolutionary Guard and Quds Force, meaning Soleimani. The land bridge is part of that. The problem is the Department of Defense and Department of State say this land bridge doesn't exist yet. <laughs> it doesn't exist yet. This is the current state of Iraq. These are the main entry ports that, that the IRGC and Quds Force used to arm Shia militias as they used lethal aid like explosively formed penetrators and other things against American forces. Uh, they brag that they killed more Americans than, than Al-Qaeda. Our focus uh, has primarily been on the number of Americans that have been killed by explosively formed penetrators. We're not talking about indirect fire. We're not talking about sniper operations. We're not talking about uh, Assad's facilitation of a foreign fighter network into Iraq to kill Americans. And Assad's intel officers don't do anything without the, the uh, approval or the roger out from the RGC Quds Force. So this is Iraq as it stands now. Entry points here. This is all under sheer control. This, these used to be the areas, of course, where as you see red, ISIS used to control that, so that used to be black. Now it's red, but it's not red because it's under Sunni control. 
it's red because this is where we were able to depend on our Sunni allies in the past, the Sons of Iraq, the Awakening, uh, the key pillar of our surge strategy in 2007. We were able to depend on those red areas to not only go after Al Qaeda, but to also halt the advances of IRGC Quds Force backed Shia militias. These areas now in red are, are Sunni areas, but they're actually under the control of the Hashid al Shabi. The the militias, and, and I'm gonna break down the nuance of what the hospital shabby, the shoe militias actually are. And how many military people do we have here? Any retired people? Anybody familiar with how command and control structures work? That's all I'll need you to know. All right, so this is an area where we're able to depend on our Sunni allies and Kurdish allies to disrupt this land bridge the issue right now, the strongest tribe is Iran. It's not the central government. It's not the, it's not the United States. It is Iran. And this, this discussion is about Iraq post-ISIS, post-ISIS, first iteration ISIS. And it is firmly in the hands of Iran. And the land bridge that is so key to what we're trying to do in Syria so in this area, Qasem Soleimani has deployed Iraqi militias. One of those militias is Harakat Nujeba. Uh, and it has been attacked by US aircraft for attacking, trying to push on our special operations training effort in this area of Syria. Mm -hmm. We're building a force not only to go against ISIS, but to go against uh, some of, some of uh, Assad's uh, forces as well. The al Qaim entry point into Syria they can use this one or they can use this one. This was the one that was tough until they moved on Kurdistan. So they secured the, the routes into Kirkuk and now they can go straight into Mosul. They now have control of something that, to me, just demonstrates how much we're willing to obfuscate the role of Iran in Iraq. This area here is called Fish Kabul, just north of the hook. It is our key logistical supply line to support our effort in Syria. It's where our special operators, it's where we work with Syrian Kurds and Iraqi Kurds to secure that checkpoint, and it is now under the control of Barakor and Kitab Hezbollah. What's that? <coughs> Barakor and Kitab Hezbollah from the Hashr al-Shabi, from the Shia militias. Yeah. Mushkila Kabir, big problem. Um, we're saying that's not true. We're saying it's now being controlled by elements of the YPG. <laughs> The problem is the YPG, anybody, everybody familiar with the YPG? Our Kurdish allies, our Kurdish temporary allies in Syria that have been uh, very helpful in the destruction of ISIS, but are not the force to hold Raqqa and Deir Azur. They will trade it away. They are now looking at Americans and saying, wait a minute, you think we're going to work with you? You think we're not gonna bargain our position, we're not gonna leverage our position with the Russians and the Iranians? because of what we've done to the Kurdish in Iraq. They're able to point across the border, not even across the border, at this border crossing that used to be controlled by KDP Peshmerga and say, you abandoned that ally <laughs> that you've worked with for more than a decade. Why not us? And why not us? You're, you're telling us that you're gonna be here? And you know who the person that's telling them that, to trust us? Is the same person that nobody trusts in Iraq. <laughs> who is that? Brett McGurk. McGurk. I didn't say it. He said it. Brett McGurk. Um, I, I spoke to some very influential Iraqis from Sunni parties, Sunni secular parties, Sunni Islamist party, uh, Iraqi government, Peshmerga, and Syrians. And they have said that your position, we, we can't trust, trust the Americans anymore. We've relied on temporary alliances to somehow shape temporary solutions and they're leading to permanent ramifications mm -hmm. and permanent giveaways. So I don't think the land bridge is a permanent giveaway yet. This, this, everything that I'm doing now, whether it's at Hudson or whether it's talking to you today, is a counter narrative to what people are saying. Uh, you, we, there have been several reports, three reports in prominent periodicals in the last week that have said <coughs> Iran can't, you just can't do anything about Iran at this point. They've already reached their position, they're already, uh, you know, you know, the power that they've, they've wanted to be, they've always had these you know, hegemonic goals in, in, in the region, they're there now, there's nothing we can do. And the tilde is now, look how destabilizing Saudi Arabia is. And uh, I had this conversation at the Middle East Institute dinner last night 
with a couple prominent people to look at Syria and Iraq, and they said, so what about this, this Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia? Look how destabilizing he is. And I said, well, <coughs> so who has more influence in Baghdad? Uh, Tehran or Riyadh? Tehran. In Beirut, Tehran. In Damascus, Tehran. In Sana'a, Tehran. Um, what Mohammed bin Salman is, is trying to do is, um, for the most part, is a, a, a power move to tell people that it's more important, the, the position that I hold is more important than how much money you have. The position I hold is, is more important than your adventurous moves. Now, this is not a defense of MBS. This is just basically, I'm trying to counter these narratives. You gotta get the what else out there. The, the, the uh, you know, this, this moral equivalency between how bad Iran is versus how bad Saudi is, is a concerted effort to allow Iran to continue to do what, what they're doing. So this is in place, the uh, Department of Defense says it's not in place. Now here's the biggest, biggest argument. This is what I have to fight against. So Brett McGurk and, and a great American Marine General, General Dunford, went to Capitol Hill and, and told congressional members that we have to be one Iraq people. We have to be a one Iraq uh, government because if we don't, it'll be a slap in the face to every veteran who ever served in Iraq because it failed. Well, I'm a veteran who served, and I know a lot of veterans have served. And I was a one Iraq guy before Ramadi, before Fallujah, and before Mosul, where I saw a government not empower its Sunni population to push back against ISIS, but a government that punished its Sunni population for being governed by ISIS. And when I talked here, when I spoke here in March of 2016, I said, listen, a Sunni military-age male in Mosul cannot drive down the road, pick up a phone, and, and call the cops and say, listen, there's an Al-Qaeda member in my neighborhood. Come get him. There was no one to call. They were never empowered to do this. Since that March 2016 uh, presentation, um, we've seen what's happened to, to Ramadi, Fallujah, and now, now Mosul. And then we saw Hawija. And if, if, if anybody goes back to the March 2016 uh, presentation, I talk about the Hashid al-Shabi and that it doesn't seem that like it's built to take back cities from ISIS, that it's built to move on infrastructure, punish, but it's built to move on Kurdistan. And it had all the indicators. And we look at the Hawija offensive. The Hawija offensive was the last offensive. It's a little bit off the map. It's right down here. Uh, where the last ISIS holdout. And the force that was being moved in there to take on 600 guys was too big. It was huge. And it was an indicator. This force is not there to exit ISIS. This force is here to move on Kurdistan. And 72 hours later, they moved on Kurdistan. Then we find out, wait a minute, there's another ISIS pocket just north of Ramadi. They were always comfortable leaving these pockets out there. Remember, Ramadi was cleared in October, November, December 2015. It was a goal to go in there and get ISIS out and declare victory. We've never had a, a counterinsurgency operation in Iraq where Amer an American general went into a city and said, okay, we've destroyed it, we're good. Al-Qaeda's dead. That's what's happened in this campaign. Uh, there are still ISIS attacks in Baghdad, ISIS attacks in Ramadi, in Tikrit, in Fallujah, and I came back from Mosul 60 days ago. And I landed in Erbil, and I talked to a Peshmerga general, and I said, how do I get to Mosul? And he said, your most difficult thing is to be able to get out of Kurdistan. Getting into Mosul is easy. So I had a harder time getting through Ashayi's checkpoints in Mosul, or in, in Kurdistan, than I did going into Mosul. Um, we were almost turned, turned away uh, in, in uh, Kurdistan, just uh, south of, or just north of Mosul. We got into Mosul, military checkpoints are one and two guys, and I'm a, I'm a tall gringo from Texas, mm -hmm. and sitting in the back of a car trying not to look like an American. Mm -hmm. And I've got these sunglasses, I'm like, so I've got to take those off. I had a baseball cap on, better take that off. And then I said, well, I look more American now than, than ever. So I, <laughs> I try to get some, the key is get some really, really uh, flashy sunglasses and, and uh, just act like you know where you're going. But nobody even looked in the car. They said, go, go. So we, there's, Mosul is already set up for security backslide. The force that went into Mosul is not one that cares about staying. Uh, so the day after ISIS, I argue, is the day before ISIS in a lot of cases. Um, the Sunni population and now the Kurdish population are more distrustful of Baghdad than they've ever been. 
more distrustful of the United States than they've ever been. And the hardest part of this is getting phone calls and getting messages from Peshmerga soldiers and officers that I worked with saying, Mike, what's going on? And you, you think about this, this has to be exactly, and, it, and we worked with the Sunni Sons of Iraq and the Awakening, what they felt like when we abandoned them after the surge and left them open to Al-Qaeda attacks, Shia militia attacks, Al-Qaeda reprisal attacks, ISIS as the new iteration of Al-Qaeda, and then Shia militias again. And it, when you're building these relationships and you're trying to, to forge new allies, you know, you, you can't have the Peshmerga be an example of American abandonment, of an American failure to maintain a relationship. And uh, I truly believe that, I have to believe this because, you know, we, we were able to get the Iran deal decertified. We were able to get the Revolutionary Guard Corps designated in its entirety as a terrorist organization. The president gave a speech on a Friday, and like I said, 60 hours later, the gentleman, General Qasem Soleimani, I should not have said gentleman, but this charismatic leader, this designated terrorist, 60 hours later, used Quds Force militias, Kitab Hezbollah, Badr Corps, and the Sab Ahl Haq to move on Kurdish areas. You know, the government could have had a legitimate, had a legitimate uh, basis to, to do something. Okay, we're going to put this back under federal control. You could simply do that by asking the Peshmerga, can you, you secure these areas and then we're going to move in and we'll have these joint security checkpoints like we had when Maliki tried to do this in 2008. The problem I have is listening to a State Department official or Department of Defense official say that these aren't Iranian militias. Iran's not here. These are the federal police, and anybody who's ever worked Iraq and is in the intel community knows the federal police are Badr Corps. Badr Corps is the RGC's Quds Force premier proxy. And these are counterterrorism forces. Think about that for a second. Think about a government using their counterterrorism forces to go into a neighborhood, to go into a city and restore order. The same forces you used against ISIS, you're now using against your own people, the Peshmerga, the Kurds. And it doesn't sell, does it? It doesn't sell. Where's the Iraqi army? And this is the argument that I had with the Iraqi deputy chief of mission. I said, listen, I would have been comfortable if the 4th Iraqi Army Division took command of Kirkuk. <laughs> Problem is the 4th Iraqi Army Division doesn't exist anymore. I would have been happy if the 2nd Iraqi Army Division took control of Mosul. Problem is it doesn't exist anymore. I would be happy if the 3rd Iraqi Army Division took control of Talafar. It doesn't exist anymore. In its place are RGC Quds Force command and control militias. And here's the, here's the, uh, the nuance. See, I, I have a different definition of nuance than the intelligence community has. Nuance in the intelligence community means water it down so nobody takes a side and we just kind of push it out there and we're, we're not going to get in trouble for right or we're wrong. To me, nuance means let me explain how this works and here are the levels. So the Hashid al-Shabi. So Sistani, anybody, everybody knows who Sistani is? Sistani is, is, is a cleric in Iraq who issued a fatwa calling for volunteers. 100,000 people rose up with no command and control structure for them to fall under. The Iraqi military couldn't absorb them all. Guess who said that we can? It was the IRC Quds Force militias. Badr Corps was so well established in the MOI that they already had the command and control structure to bring them under. Asab al Haq, a designated terrorist group that killed Americans, was another part of that chain of command. Kitab Hezbollah is part of this command and control structure, another designated terrorist organization. This is what this is all about now, right? So, so this is what I've been doing the last month. I've been briefing congressional members on this, and I have a strategy. Now, I am a Republican. <laughs> I didn't know I was a Republican until uh, President Clinton floated Patricia Schroeder as Secretary of Defense. And I said, I'm a Republican. I'm against this. This doesn't make sense. She, she hates the military. I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm a Republican. I was actually digging, digging what Jerry Brown had to say prior to that. You know? I'm like, I don't know what I am. And I know what I am, but I'm not a, a partisan. I, I, I'm fact-based. 
I'm happy to have my mind changed. I will go where the facts lead me. Um, <laughs> this is a problem because this right here, you, you can't understand how General Mattis, McMaster, you know, these, these generals that I worked with. So I worked with McMaster in 2007. When I, when I, again, I'm going back to March 2016 because I didn't mention his name then because he wasn't National Security Advisor at the time. But I worked for him and we worked for Petraeus and we focused on this. This is what our job was, to determine the level of IRGC influence in the Iraqi Ministry of Interior, Ministry of, of Defense, and the intelligence apparatus. This is Qasem Soleimani, okay? This is Hadi al Amri. This is the Badr Corps commander, right? He is the commander of the Hospital Shabi. That's where that command and control fits in. Um, this gentleman over here is Haji Shibal. He's killed Americans. He's killed Americans. He was in Cropper for killing Americans. This is Abu Mehdi al Mahendis, designated terrorist from Kitab Hezbollah who has killed Americans. He's also killed Americans in Kuwait. He's, he's a designated terrorist for what he did. He has a current um, extradition request so that he can be tried and executed for blowing up embassies in Kuwait in the 80s. This is the deputy commander of the volunteers that Sistani rose up. This is the commander of the volunteers. On his organization's patch, his face is present, along with Khomeini and Hamani. He is quoted recently, him saying it on video, I am a proud soldier for Qasem Soleimani. Whatever he wants me to do, I'll do. So here's the nuance, the Hashim Shabi. Mike, Mike, they're not all IRGC Quds Force militias. They're not. I said, okay, they're not. But 20% are, and the 20% are in the command and control. And this next slide, kind of demonstrates everything. So how, <laughs> this is how, this is how obvious this is, and because it's so obvious, I need more. I don't know why that is, <laughs> because it's a known, it somehow requires more evidence. Um, this is the current Prime Minister of Iraq, Haider al Abadi. This is Abu Mehdi al Mohendis. Mohendis, Mohendis forced the Prime Minister of Iraq to give him control of the payroll for the Hashid al-Shabi. We didn't want the Hashid al-Shabi operating as independent militias, so we said, hey, let's DDR them. Anybody familiar with the term DDR? It's a disarm, demobilize, and reintegrate. So we wanted to do that. Or they, basically, they sold it to the Americans, hey, that sounds great. Department of State, we're just going to bring them into the Ministry of Interior so we have control of them. Problem is, they brought them in as units. <laughs> they brought in um, Abu Mehdi al Mohandis into the MOI as the guy who controls the distribution of funds and equipment. So the Sistani volunteers haven't been paid in months. His guys get paid. And what they're basically doing is they're creating a farm league of Sistani volunteers that they can steal away talent and bring them into these militias. So the money that they get, he decides where, his, where it goes. Uh, I was in Mosul 60 days ago and I stopped at a hospital shabby checkpoint. One guy was a Sistani volunteer, the other guy was a Badr Corps member. The Sistani volunteer had a pistol that he, take, he took off a, an ISIS guy that he killed in Mosul. The Badr Corps guy had a nice uniform and a nice AK-47. The Sistani guy hadn't been paid in four months, the Sistani guy wants to be a Badr Corps guy. And the Badr Corps guy is, it's almost like he's doing an evaluation on him. He's gonna do an NCOER, or a, a non-commissioned officer evaluation report, an officer evaluation report on on this Sistani volunteer to see if he's worthy of getting in. So that's the new ones. Yes, they're not all IRC Quds Force militias, but if these 10 people here are, and the rest of us fall under their command and control, are we independent anymore? <laughs> We're not. We fall under that command and control. So we are proxies. We are tools of the Quds Force. And that's what's happening. And this is the biggest disgrace of this whole thing, is the use of American M1 Abrams tanks by Iranian militias to not only punish the Sunni populations of Iraq, Sunni Arab populations, but now to move against Kurdish positions. Not only against Kurdish positions in Iraq, but they're now moving these, this equipment to Syria to go after US trained allies. 
And this is happening. The reason we're not talking about it is because we don't have a footprint on the ground to develop sources. We don't have a footprint on the ground of American advisors at all levels of the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Defense, that would ensure that end of use items don't get into the hands of Iranian proxy militias. This is not good enough. Uh, there's a picture of General Votel from CENTCOM with Qasem al -Araji. If you don't know who Qasem al -Araji is, he was detained twice by American intelligence and JSOC, J Joint Special Operations Forces, for sneaking across lethal aid to kill Americans. Explosives, money, twice he was detained. The Iraqi government doesn't take SIGINT, signals intelligence as evidence, doesn't take human intelligence as evidence. They want to see him crossing the border with the stuff in his hand. If they don't see that, then the evidence doesn't count. We could not present them intel because we also didn't want to disclose sources and methods. But they said if you don't have his hand in the cookie jar, then he didn't do it. And that's uh, one of the biggest problems. Qasem al Raji is now the minister for Iraq's Ministry of Interior. So there's a picture of General Votel <laughs> sitting next to Qasem al Raji who's an IRGC Quds Force Badr commander. He's in the Badr Corps, which is the IRGC's premier uh, militia. And he's asking him, he's the director of the Ministry of Interior, we have a US training equip program in the Ministry of Interior, and he's asking him, are US funds and equipment getting into the hands of IRGC Quds Force proxies? And literally his answer is, no. <laughs> is that good enough? I mean, you're literally sitting with a guy who is a Soleimani lieutenant asking him if his ministry is somehow hijacking the U.S. training equip program. Brent McGurk says it's not happening because we're monitoring the end of use. We're not. When I was there, that was my job. We had 160,000 soldiers on the ground embedded all the way down to the battalion and company level of the Iraqi military. These militias were on the joint targeting list. They were not parading around uh, in cities. They weren't le legitimate. They wouldn't sh dare show their faces or take selfies on the battlefield. Um, this is not happening. It's not good enough for the State Department to say this is not a violation of the Leahy Law. It is. Patrick Leahy. So this is the strategy, okay? I went, going back to where I said I was a Republican, people don't like Donald Trump. Democrats don't like our president. So we're going after Democrats to get them on board to criticize the president for allowing this to happen. Because the president doesn't know this is happening because he's not being briefed by it. Uh, a person that I trust, the person that I've known for a while, a, a, a guy who knows ISIS very well, told me that Brett McGurk's talent is saying, Mike, Mike, no, 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 Mike, we're taking care of all this. This isn't happening anymore. This is an old foot. This is old. They, we knew we're aware of that, we're working on that. We get, we get that. <laughs> that land bridge, we're counting on the Iraqi military to stop Iran from doing this. We're counting on the Iraqi Ministry of Interior to stop this. We, we got this. We know what we're doing. I'm like, you are, you, you, you know, if I had the opportunity, I would say, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not true. And you know, remember, you're, you're the guy that told Tehran, Baghdad, Ankara, and DC that you could stop the Kurdish vote that you could stop the referendum. You are also the same guy that has told the Kurds for 10 years, wait, wait for the referendum, eventually we'll get there. Each year that we told the, the, the Kurds to wait for this referendum, US leverage declined and Iranian leverage increased. And, and the Kurds knew that quite well. When I was in Kurdistan on my last trip, I was asked, you know, before the referendum, should we do this? I said, you, ha you have to do it. If you don't do it, you're never gonna have an opportunity to do it again. And I said this, and I'll take credit, I'll take credit and blame for this. I said, if you do this, minds will change. If you do this, American minds will change. Well, we're seeing some momentum in Congress. The, president, the president's mind has not changed because I don't believe he knows. I don't believe he knows how serious this is. That if you have a strategy and you put it down on paper, you have a legis legislative strategy that says, or, you know, you actually have tools in place. Designate the Quds Force. Designate IRGC. Stop what Iran is doing in Iraq. You have the tools to do this. Well, the one way you do that, if you want to fight ISIS, keep ISIS from coming back, and, and halt the Iranian invasion of Iraq, you simply move the U.S. training and advisory role to our bill. You can still target ISIS. You can take away what now is that land bridge going across northern Iraq. 
And you can actually build leverage with Baghdad by showing them that you're not going to put up with this anymore. You can also build Sunni outreach into Mosul and these other places. These divisions that I mentioned, the 2nd Iraqi Army, 3rd Iraqi, 4th Iraqi Army divisions, were divisions that I served with when I was in uniform. They were highly trained Sunnis and Kurds, trained by Americans and vetted. Maliki kicked them all out, put Shias in place. He wanted a, a, a coup protection force, and he wanted to basically neutralize, limit, constrain effective Sunni and Kurdish leaders. These divisions don't exist anymore. And when we, when we spoke a year and a half ago, and we, when we did this, we talked about, listen, it's, 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 it's this simple. Put out a call. How many of you used to serve in the Iraqi army? Come back, get, get a back promotion, one rank, and six months uh, back pay. That would have been nothing as far as the, the U.S. Uh, investment in Iraq at this point. We didn't do that. Here's what's so bad at this point. Again, Badapur, Kitab, Hezbollah. This is important. You, you can't drive a U.S. If you find a tank on the battlefield, Anybody here ever been an armor, a tanker? Anyone? Yep. Can, can, can you find an M1 Abrams on the battlefield and drive it if you're ISIS? Or if you, you can't. You put it on the back of a truck and you move it out. I've spoken to, to tankers on the M1 A1, A1 Abrams. Um, you can't drive it unless you've been trained. And you can't drive it in the Iraqi military unless you've been trained by a U.S. advisor. And this should never happen. You know, these militia members brag that they can wear any uniform in the Iraqi military. So that's who's getting trained. And here's, here's an issue here. And, and this is where, you know, we should focus. The, the pilots that are being trained in the United States right now from Iraq are the ones that were selected by these militias and by Qasem Soleimani. Th there's no doubt. Sunnis aren't getting this training. A Sunni with a tank is an enemy. A Kurd with a tank is an enemy. A Kurdish pilot is an enemy. A Sunni pilot is an enemy. And Qasem Soleimani didn't care if you were Shia, Sunni, or Christian when he had an execution campaign against Iraqi pilots in 2005, 6, and 7 to go after them regardless of religion because they were a threat to Tehran. Tehran will not allow anything that we develop militarily in Iraq to become a threat to Tehran. And that's why the people that get trained on these tanks are their guys. Uh, the 9th Iraqi Army Division was an armor unit. The 1st Iraqi Army Division is an armor unit. All the Sunnis were kicked out of both divisions. And this was under our nose in 2007, 8, and 9. And those divisions now are still active. The divisions that I spoke about earlier have now been disbanded. So again, Qasem Soleimani, Mohandas the engineer, and Haji Shibwa. And every one of them killed Americans. Every one of them is now a legitimate member of the Ministry of Interior, with the exception of Qasem Soleimani, who runs it, by the way, and are getting American paychecks because we basically fund the MOI. We fund the MOI and the MOD. This is a problem. And next slide, sir. And this is the, the biggest offense to me. This gentleman here is Case Kazali. This is what I worked on when I was in Iraq. This man and his group, the League of the Righteous, or Asab Aho Haq, conducted an operation in Karbala where they kidnapped five Americans to trade them for four IRGC members. Qasem Soleimani ordered this operation. That's Qasem Soleimani to the right, that's Case Kazali to the, to the left. Our correction, to the right, he's on the left. The kidnapping operation went wrong early. Four Americans were executed in the back of a vehicle. One American died on the objective and was awarded a silver star uh, after his heroic actions. We were able to show Prime Minister Maliki intelligence that blamed this on Qasem Soleimani and on, on uh, Case Kazali. Case Kazali was detained, his brother was detained, Doc Duke from Lebanese Hezbollah was detained. They were all at Cropper and we met with them on a weekly basis to get them to reconcile. Because at the time I was working with a group called the Force Strategic Engagement Cell, which was set up by General Lamb of the British SAS and McChrystal of our JSOC. And we had a, a, a mission, find reconcilables, and if, you can, if, you, if they're irreconcilable, then they go back on the targeting list. And this gentleman here was somebody we were never gonna let go. We had all the evidence. So Qasem Soleimani now gets a paycheck from the MOI, gets a paycheck from the Quds Force, used M1 Abrams tanks to move on uh, Al Tuz, is that what it's called? Al Tuz, uh, south of Kurdistan, 60 hours after the oh, president's cool. speech. South of Kirkuk, yeah. 
uh, after the president's speech on Qasem Soleimani, if you think about what he said. And his, this guy is so not worried about anything that he opened up a recruiting center in Kirkuk behind the, the Marjan Hotel, I think the Marjan Hotel, literally put on an ad, hey, come on down to our recruiting center behind the Marjan Hotel and join AAH so you can kill Peshmerga, so you can kill Kurds, you can kill Sunnis. Uh, that, that right there demonstrates how much of a failure our ISIS strategy has been in Iraq because it's basically turned allies, Sunni allies we lost a while back, our Kurdish allies, we do not ever want them to be enemies. There will not be a more potent fighter or a bigger danger to American forces than an, an angry, justified, and legitimate Peshmerga fighter who sees his town destroyed by a Qasem Soleimani-led force. And I, I know it sounds alarmist, it sounds big, but you know, warnings and indicators. The Peshmerga official army website is now calling for the United States to exit Kurdistan because we didn't provide aid after the, after the earthquake. Has that changed at all? It should change. Baghdad has not provided aid after the earthquake. Tehran has not provided aid after the earthquake. Ankara has not provided aid after the 7.2 earthquake in Kurdistan. This gentleman here is part of this DDR process that we talk about that sells well to state and sells well to experts. I'm a former military guy. I spent 20 years in the military. This is how it works. I go to the Pentagon. I work at the Pentagon for a year, and I try to get out. I'm there at the Pentagon for a year. I somehow am now in charge of this program, and I want it to be successful. We're going to call it DDR. I'm not an expert. I don't know who he is. I'm there for a year, and I'm looking at my next assignment, and I tell you this is a good process, this DDR process. Disarm, demobilize, and reintegrate. This terrorist, his, his group, Asab al Haq, they're being proposed to be the 8th, 9th, and 10th Iraqi Army Divisions. Think about that for a second. Out of the Ministry of Defense to have a designated terrorist group be able to not only get a paycheck from the Quds Force, get a paycheck from the MOD, be able to operate in an MOD uniform, also be able to operate in a, Kitab, uh, a AH uniform as, as a legitimate deputized force as part of this DDR process. These are things that we, we, we just, we, can't, we won't be taken seriously if we allow it to happen. And I'm, I'm not saying that I have any faith that we're gonna stop it, but we need to go back to what I said about Brett McGurk and the land bridge and saying none of this is happening. I, I get, prove me wrong, please, on all these things. I'm happy to be wrong on all of this. This is the Iraqi Army Division, or Iraqi Army units that Brett McGurk says will stop the Iranian land bridge. They're actually built to facilitate it. And, and, and here's the, the, the strategy of Iran, and everybody here who's followed Iran knows this. Strategy is to punish Jerusalem at some point, punish Israel at some point, and you do that by establishing logistical operational supply lines, by establishing presence. Right now, there's a Russian Congress to stop Iran from building bases in Syria, where they're building advanced, uh, they're, they're actually weaponizing, they're increasing the, if, the efficacy of uh, land-based uh, missiles, uh, technology, so they can have precise, they can hit precision targets. They can hit with precision. Right now, they basically just launch in that direction and hope, inshallah, something happens. Now they can say, I want to hit that house. And we're wondering, well, how did they get to that? How were they able to move this stuff into Syria? Well, through Iraq. And, and our intelligence community cannot think that for a second that you're going to be looking at Iranian flagged armor columns going across Iraq or a, an obvious Iranian military convoy going across Iraq. These convoys, to, this, to, to date, when these militias are moved into these positions where I showed that map, um, they, are where, they fly Iraqi flags. And you, you can't fire on Iraqi flags without firing on a sovereign country. Problem is, there is no sovereignty in Iraq if you're an Iraqi nationalist, if you're a Sunni, if you're a Kurd, if you're a Shia nationalist because your government has been sold out to Tehran. This is very telling. This is Hadi al Amri again, the commander of Barra Corps, Iran's longest serving proxy. One of these gentlemen that speaks English, you know, presents well to US military commanders. When I've had a chance to brief mili the military forces that are going to Iraq, I'm briefing the 10th Mountain in February, 
they'll probably be asked not to come to Iraq, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, I say, how many of you have been there before? And the rank and file have not. The senior NCOs and senior officers have. And uh, I said, you're going to have a very effective fighting force that's going to be willing to take on ISIS or ISIS 2.0. Or but the problem is they see anybody who's a Sunni military age male as ISIS. This gentleman here, Hadi Lamri, is polling higher than the current prime minister. He, his successes, uh, he can credit success for Tikrit, Qasem Soleimani as well, Tikrit, Fallujah, Ramadi, and Mosul, and Kirkuk. Because when the Kirkuk offensive happened, two gentlemen went to Kirkuk to lower the Kurdish flag and raise the Iraqi flag, and also the Bardakor flag and the Kitab Hezbollah flag. It was Hadi al Amri, and it was Abu Mehdi al Mohandis. And this is, this is what's so disappointing when you go to think tanks and you go to these uh, private roundtables where we talk about these issues. And you'll hear this argument being made, and it's, it's dominant. And it's, it's, it's an indicator of how bad this is. Well, this gentleman here is not as bad as Case Ghazali or, or Abu Mehdi al Mohandis, so he's acceptable. Can we work with him when his allegiance is to Qasem Soleimani? So we, we counter this, that narrative. That narrative came up, popped up in the, in the summer. We counter that narrative to the point now where there's a, there's a full offensive to support Haider al Abadi as a prime minister. The problem is the more the U.S. gets behind him, the more likely he is not to, to win. But the real, the nuance to all of this is it doesn't matter who the prime minister is. Iran will decide. If the United States stays, it'll probably be a body. But every candidate running so far on their platform, the number one question they're asked is how soon can you get the Americans out? And everybody running to his right is saying I can get him out sooner. Case Ghazali has a political party now and is running the 2018 elections. He's had one before, but now he can take credit for Tikrit, Fallujah, Ramadi, Mosul, and Kirkuk. Um, Mohandas has not declared, but he'll probably be the Secretary of Defense or the National Security Advisor to the next Prime Minister. Um, Haider al, al Abadi is a compromised candidate who's easily influenced by the, the parties. He's not strong. We're trying to say he is. We're trying to say the Iraqi army is his. He has no command over the Hashd of Shabi. He says he does. And, and as much as I would like to say that Sistani has control over the Hashd of Shabi, he does not. He stood them up. It's easy to say, hey, we need 100,000 volunteers. Everybody says, yes. But don't wear sectarian flags and bandanas and patches. Nobody listened. Just like Muqtad al-Sada with Jaisal Mehdi. Uh, we're going to do a ceasefire. Are we going to kill Americans? Yeah, everybody wants to do it. Stop killing Americans. They don't listen. They become special groups. They become Asab al-Haq. They become Kitab al They become these other groups. So there's a, a lack of control in this area. But we're touting it, this as a success. We don't know how many civilians were killed in Mosul. We don't know how many civilians were killed in Ramadi and Fallujah. But Mosul, conservative estimates from NGOs and UN people on the ground estimate 20,000 civilians were killed. That's low end, but there's no talk about that. There's no talk about how many people died in a city of 500,000, Ramadi, when Kitab Hezbollah's militias were rocketing and pummeling this city with crude artillery. Um, I, I took a picture of Mosul over my right shoulder when I, when I went to just show the destruction of the old city. And it was also to answer, again, you know, what do you know? You, you, what do you know about Iraq? You're not Iraqi. Like, well, you know, I spent a lot of time there. My country spent a lot of time there. A lot of Americans have died, so we do have a say. We do have a, a, a right to critique things, especially if we're there. Um, and so I went there to say, Listen, I, I, I'm here. This is, I walked these same streets when I was in uniform, and I walked these same streets when I was working as an intelligence officer, as, a, as an advisor. And now you can't walk the streets because you can't get down a street because it's been rubble or because there's unexploded ordnance. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the last time the United States destroyed a city in Iraq was Fallujah 2004 and 2005. And now we somehow, if you look at Syria, Iran sees this as one battlefield. ISIS sees this as one battlefield. The United States sees it as two distinct separate places where we can do something here and do the opposite in the other place. And so 
you provide air power to a Shia proxy force in Iraq to go after the Sunni, Sunni militias, and you criticize Russia for doing the same thing in Syria. They're using a proxy force on the ground, an Iranian proxy force, to punish Sunni population centers. Shia militias are now saying they're going to Syria to fight ISIS. They're not. They're going to take territory away from the YPG. They're going to take territory away from the, the SDF. And there's always an ISIS fighter you can kill. But in every case, and there's something interesting, the article that you sent me about the coordination by our proxy forces on the ground. When I say that, the, the Iraqi military, the federal police, the Hashid al-Shabi, the counterterrorism forces, in each of these cases has, has allowed the exit of ISIS fighters from Fallujah, Ramadi, Mosul, to Crete, and now we're doing it in Deir Ezzur and Raqqa. Again, ISIS is morphing into the Al-Qaeda model. They've learned not to raise a flag because unless you can shoot down a military aircraft, you don't want to let everybody know you're here. So you go into this, this Al-Qaeda model, but we have not defeated ISIS. We've taken away real estate and we've discredited, uh, discredited by supporting governments that have oppressed their people, if that makes any sense. Baghdad's worse off with the Sunnis and, and the Kurdish Sunnis, the Sunni Arabs and, and Kurds because of, because of this blatant US support to a sectarian government's overreaction and heavy-handed tactics against its population in the name of fighting ISIS. They're doing the same thing now with the Peshmerga. They're going to do the same thing now with what we're, who we're working with in Syria. And this all plays to Iran. And again, Iran's not a conventional force. The decertification of the Iran deal keeps Iran from becoming an economic power, keeps it from becoming a conventional force, and now allows us to target it when it starts to weaponize and starts to do things. The JCPOA provided them cover to do this over 10 years, to become an economic power, to become a conventional military power, and then, at the end of the day, simply put a warhead on top of a ballistic missile that was not part of the JCPOA, but part of the UN Security Council resolutions. So this, everything is great about what happened with decertification. The problem is decertification and designating the IRC means nothing if you don't do anything here. And that's, that's the problem right now. We, we're not afraid of Iran by any means. We're not, but we're allowing this strategic chess player to take advantage of inaction. To take advantage of, of the loss of momentum. So the president gets praised for 59 cruise missiles in Syria because Assad used sarin gas on his population. And we had an opportunity to create a schism between Moscow and Tehran because Tehran and Assad looked at Putin and said, why are you here if you can't stop these American cruise missiles from attacking our bases? Or did you coordinate with the Trump administration to do this? And we didn't follow up. We didn't say the next barrel bomb is the same thing as a sarin gas attack. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to hold Assad accountable for his intelligence officers and his security apparatus for allowing Sunni military age males to move in from Maghreb and other places in the Middle East into Iraq to kill Americans. So now you can actually hold Iran accountable through its proxies for Sunni attacks on Americans, Sunni suicide attacks, Sunni high profile attacks when that foreign fighter came in through Syria. Because you didn't just go through Syria, you actually stopped at a holding area. You were briefed by not only Al Qaeda members, but Syrian intel. And, and you were allowed to, to be assessed. It was a job interview. What do you do? You're a sniper, good, we can use you. You can build a car bomb. You're good at computers. You're good at uh, you know, information operations. You're good at the brand. I want to make sure there's time for questions. How am I looking on time? 15 minutes. All right, so I'm going to stop in two minutes. But this was a, 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 an area to assess your, your capability. So if you show up and say, I want to kill Americans, and I'm going to go back home and talk about it on social media. They're like, what, what, do you have a skill? No, but I want to do this. We have the best job for you. You are the Shaheed. <laughs> you will blow yourself up. You're the car bomb guy. Like, but I don't want to do that. I just want to kill Americans. No, brother, brother, brother. This is the most important job. We're going to put you in this two-week training program where we tell you that, you know, by the, you know, Hamsa Daiga, after 10 minutes, you'll be in heaven with your, your virgins. And this takes me to a quick, quick thing. Back in 2005, I'm on a checkpoint with a Kurdish general, and we're basically looking for car bombs dismounted. 
So imagine being at a checkpoint, there's a bunch of cars, and you're asking each car, al-hadha Is this a car bomb? They're like, no, 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 And then he looks at me and he says, brother, if we die, within seconds we'll be in heaven. And I thought, this is a great bonding moment with my Peshmerga officer. And he goes, but you? No virgins. And I'm like, he said that. I can't believe that. That's just not right. And he said, okay, two. You get two. Anyway, that was, a, that was a cool story. So if you don't have a skill, you become a suicide bomber. But if you have a skill, you're assessed by Syrian intel as somebody that they can continue to develop on how to build an ID, on how to do sniper operations, on how to do these things. Then you get to go into Iraq and kill Americans because Iran wanted to punish us for being in Iraq because they viewed somehow us being in Afghanistan and Iraq as your next. You know, I would feel the same way. You got the, the Americans to the north and you have the Americans to the west. What do you do? So I'm gonna open it up to questions there. I hope that fit the, the mold of this thing. But this is very, this is very concerning and we, you know, we have legislation in now to, to, to sanction Iraqi militias. The World Bank is even skeptical of doing business with Baghdad now, which is great. Because if anybody knows Iran, the Revolutionary Guard Corps has its tentacles in every aspect of the Iranian economy, every sector. They're now doing that in Iraq. And the, one of the best parts about having these tools is Russia's doing the same thing. You can punish Russia, you can do these things. And I talked about getting Democrats on board to oppose Trump's policies in Iraq and Syria. This is a way to get them. Hey, Russia, Russia's doing this with Iran and Iraq, and Trump's allowing it. You know, let's do something about that. Hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good Republican, but sir, you know, I love the fact that I used to be an enlisted guy because being an enlisted guy taught me you can say something, you can, you can speak your mind, and then you're told to sit down and be quiet, but at least you got it out there. And I've always viewed that as a badge of courage as being an officer when, when commanders told me you're too much of an NCO. I'm like, well, I like that. <laughs> I like that. That's a good place to be. Anyway, I'll open up to questions. You mentioned earlier that the president did not know some of this. I don't know, but what I'm reading is that the Sebastian Gorka still may have his ear, and that he's one to tell. We had a joint press conference with Sebastian Gorka, Trin Franks, Duncan Hunter, myself, um, Lee Zeldin, and uh, DeSantis. And Gorka spoke, and we spoke about these things. And we're trying to get to the president because I truly believe that a president is made to feel foolish about something. He tends to do something about it. It may not be the right thing all the time, but he tends to do something about it. We want him to, this is an easy fix. This is, there are, is no more of an American uh, group of people in the Middle East than the anti-Iranian Peshmerga of the Hook and Erbil. And, and this, the nationalists in Iraq, Sunnis and Shia, are looking for the U.S. to give them some sort of signal that we're going to push back against Iran. The, the thing that I heard is that the president has told his national security uh, staff, do not give me my own Iraq war. Well, sir, you get it anyway. Mm -hmm. And you get it if you ignore this, and it's accelerated, mm -hmm. and it's more costly. So you get it anyway, head it off now, because Iran is a paper tiger now. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do a lot, you just have to know what to do, and it's pretty easy. You have a lot of willing partners, and a lot of willing, uh, a lot of, uh, willing uh, regional allies that can do that. I noticed that the president uh, uh, came out not making a commitment to the Kurds, but the Kurds seem like they're the most uh, stable group together. And they were sympathetic to the Americans and also Christians. A lot of their groups protected Christians. So uh, it's a tragedy that the Kurds are not given their own land and that we do protect them. Is there any attempt to uh, highlight them and their needs. President Macron of France has actually been leading this effort to do something about this, to keep the Kurdish region from further being encroached upon. But what's interesting about all the, the international community that came out against the Kurdish referendum yeah. and came out against the Kurds seeking independence are the same groups that prefer to stage an Erbil and Kurdistan because it's progressive, it's Western leaning, it's, it's not a non-intrusive place where you can practice Western values in the open because Western values are already being practiced. 
and yet the international community came out against this because this one Iraq uh, fallacy. I was a one Iraq guy until we handed it over to Iran. Uh, in 2016, when I did this before, I said Iran is like an iPad. If you drop it on the floor, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> now, if you drop it on the floor, something comes out of it, something that works better, something that allows us to stay. And that is an independent Kurdish region, in my, in my opinion. And, and the reason we at least need to tilt that way, to work with the Kurds that way, is it gives us leverage with Baghdad. And in the words of Representative DeSantis, he said it best, if Tehran's upset about it, and if Ankara's upset about it, then it seems like it's the right thing to do. Yes, uh, I promise this guy and then that guy, no. Uh, my name is Kami Barthanga, the Pakistani spectator, and my question is, do you think Obama administration didn't know the connection between Osama bin Laden and Iran? And because Obama basically, you know, made Saudi Arabia kind of create a lot of animosity yes, yes. and try to bring America and Iran closer. Uh, and it, it kind of isolated Pakistan as well because, you know, Pakistani intelligence is very much involved in Saudi Arabia. Yes, yes. And they did a successful operation in, uh, uh, what do you call it, NWFP. Yes. Uh, they eliminated ISI, oh, I'm sorry, uh, ISIS. Yes. And now the, this is the first Pakistani prime minister who has been educated in Washington, D.C. And do you think that U.S. or Obama, uh, President Trump could use these all factors or variables to eliminate ISIS with the help of uh, ISI? Thanks. Yes. All right. So the best part about me being able to answer this question is the Osama bin Laden documents have been released. Uh, I worked on the Obama by SSC, the sensitive side exploitation, and we looked for links to the ISI. So the ISI had to know he was there. But at the end of the day, Hamid Ghul knew he was there because Hamid Ghul was no longer in the ISI, but he's a former director. And as Americans, when you retire, you're no longer part of the agency. In Pakistan, if you retire, you're senior. <laughs> you get to decide who the next guy is. And you get to weigh in on every subsequent director. So going back to whether the Obama administration knew about Iran's links to al-Qaeda, absolutely. And that's why they kept our team. So our team got permission on a Friday to go to D.C., on a Monday to have a week access to all the documents with translators, we already, had, we already had mined it, we knew where we wanted to go, we knew what, what reports he wanted to see. Friday night we were canceled by the National Security Council by Susan Rice. They shut down our organization and two weeks later I was let go. My whole team was let go, we were, fell under sequestration. Uh, three months prior to that we were the tip of the spear for CENCOM looking at the sensitive site exploitation of the Abbottabad uh, thing. So, so this is something that they knew, and they knew it would derail the Iran deal. And that's why they didn't do it. So now if you look at the linkages, what American would have supported the Iran deal if they knew that Iran had supported al-Qaeda and provided them safe harbor and did these things? The only time Iran ever punished al-Qaeda is when al-Qaeda operatives in Iran got so cocky that they told everybody, we're al-Qaeda, what can you do to us? And they got drunk in a bar, and the IRGC put them in jail. Osama bin Laden found out about it, scolded his guys, said, don't mess with them again. Please release my guys. I vouch for them. They won't ever do this again. Um, this is... Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you seem to tilt toward traditional allies in the Middle East, tilt toward Saudi Arabia. We shine a light on Qatar for your ties to, to these different groups. It also shines a light back on Saudi Arabia for adventurous ties to different groups. It also sends a message to the ISI for supporting the Haqqani Network, for supporting different groups. Um, again, if you look at this as an intelligence professional, you simply see that, of course, the ISI has ties to these groups because this is what traditional human intelligence looks like. You work with bad people. You do these, you find strategic angles, you find leverage. I like what, what we did, but again, another loss of momentum. I talked about the 59 cruise missiles, uh, loss of momentum by not exploiting that schism between Putin, uh, Tehran, and Damascus. There's another schism with Qatar. When you did this, and, you, and, you, and the president also talked about ceasing an alliance with Pakistan based on these things. It shines a light in everybody's face. Work with us. We know what you're doing. We know, but, but again, if you look at it, it's traditional intelligence operations. You work with bad people to find out what bad people are doing. And if you look at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia prior to our tilt, they could roll up 400 Al-Qaeda guys tomorrow if they needed to. They could roll up 400 ISIS fighters tomorrow if they needed to because they always know where they are. And the one thing when we talk about Iran and Saudi Arabia, I always ask how many Shia militias have ever attacked Tehran? How many Sunni insurgent groups have ever attacked 
Taiwan. Well, we had the ISIS group that was a loosely affiliated group of Sunni Persians or, uh, or Sunni Sunni Arabs in Iran, I believe. And uh, you know, that's that's that. So yes, they knew they knew about it, and that's why they shut down an effort to look at it, and that's how they were hesitant to release us while the JCPOA was being negotiated. Uh, yes, sir, and then you, and then you, sir. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, this gentleman, then I'll come back to you, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. No, it was my turn. You can ask if you want. No, I'll get to both of you. Go ahead. Thank you, Michael, for this presentation and thoughtful remarks. I just want to say something before I ask a question. You first mentioned that uh, this is uh, what, what uh, ISIS is like. ISIS has been defeated in Iraq, and now he has been replaced by Haji Shami or PM, uh, PMF. Uh, those people are, you said, 2.0. It's not only those. The Iraqi government itself is doing the same thing of what ISIS has been yeah. doing. Because now the Iraqi parliament is debating the uh, legislation to get... To, uh, to, to pass a bill, debating a bill to to uh, to uh, vote the legislation to get nine years old do, uh, c a child yeah, to, to get be married. married. Yes, yes. This is exactly what ISIS was doing. Yes. And this is Iraqi government is, is same thing is trying to do. So it's not only ISIS, uh, Hajdi Shabi. We having Iraqi government is the same as ISIS. Uh, this is what's happening. But my question is, I spoke with a few uh, Kurdish generals on the ground that they say. To end this, what's happening to us, the vicious attack by Hajdi Shabi, we need to get, we need to fight, we need to get to the war. Do you think the war will be solution for this? You're fighting back? Fighting back and, and so the Kurds well, will get support. We, we expected the Peshmerga to fight back in Kirkuk. Of course, the PUK collapsed and the KDP wasn't in a position to do something. But the, the Kurds did fight back uh, in, uh, north of Dehuk and inflicted casualties on the Hashir al-Shabi and the Iraqi military, and that actually uh, demonstrated to Baghdad, again, what we've been saying from the beginning, no force on the ground in Iraq has ever been successful without U.S. air power in support of it. That's the same with ISIS, it's the same with Hashir al-Shabi, that's the same with everything. On, it, on, its, on, its, on, its, uh, on its own, the Peshmerga can actually hold off, the Hashir al-Shabi can hold off the Iraqi military. The problem is whether or not you know, it's almost like you only want to fight Hashim al-Shabi because then you can, it can be justified. It's hard to fight when there's an Iraqi flag on a tank coming at you because then you look treasonous, and that's, that's the issue. Uh, going back to, to, to what you said, every, every, loss of terrain, uh, every loss of terrain by ISIS has been a gain for the Iranians in Syria and Iraq, every place. Even in traditional Sunni areas are now uh, controlled by Hashid al-Shabi, not necessarily a physical presence, but limiting the capability of local forces to defend themselves to where they actually are weakened. So they're not a threat to the Shia sectarian fault line areas, the areas along the Shia, Shia Sunni sectarian fault lines, but they're not able to actually fight ISIS. So I talked to two members of, from Ramadi about fighting ISIS, and we don't have any bullets for our guns, and it's, it's by design. And they're telling us, Dash is your problem. You have to fight ISIS on your own. So now, uh, we forced them, after this failure in Kirkuk, to move out into the desert in Anbar to go after the last pockets of ISIS. But again, you don't defeat ISIS unless you stay and hold territory. Uh, but yes, we, we, we cannot, if you look at the actions of ISIS and the Shia militias and the government, because somebody does it in a suit doesn't make them less, less of a threat if they do it, you know, dressed like a, like a guerrilla fighter. All right, sir, you, and then I'll get to you, gentlemen. Yeah. This place, uh, <coughs> I think uh, one of the main... Can you tell me, uh, can you identify yourself, sir? Intifad Kamba, Future Foundation. Okay. Um, I think it's one of the, the main reason that the assault of the Hajj al-Shabi and the IRGC on Kirkuk and the Kurds has nothing to do with the referendum. It has to do with the oil of Kirkuk. It, it was always going to happen. Yeah. Regardless. And, and sure enough, right after the occupation of Kirkuk by the Hajj, uh, the Iraqi Ministry of Oil signed a deal with the Iranians to uh, to export uh, to export oil from Kirkuk to Iran immediately. Yes. And establish a pipeline to replace the pipeline going through Turkey. Right. I just want to say something, and this is extremely dangerous and strategically going to change the the area, the region, dramatically. Kirkuk is one of the nine biggest oil fields on the on the planet. 
probably the last place would pump oil on the planet would be Kirkuk. This is got now under the control of Qasim Soleimani. Yes. Qasim Soleimani Enterprise very soon is going to have the income and of the biggest oil field in the world under its complete control. They have not. They are not hiding it. They are saying we're going to do it. And the deal between the Ministry of Oil of Iraq and the Ministry of Oil of Iran is approved and prepared by our GC and Quds Force. Yes. Now, you're going to have, the Quds Force is going to have an income from Kirkuk, equivalent to many countries in the Gulf, okay? Yes. My the, question yes. is, coming out of this, as Prime Minister Netanyahu, maybe once he was, people were talking about fighting ideas, he answered, he said, but it's, it's also very important to kill them. Yes. So I agree with him. Yeah. Now, if, if Qasem Soleimani on the terrorist list, yes. why does is the not a target? Is, why does the United States do, does not treat him equally like Osama bin Laden? You know, right, 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 right. Um, I, I mean, the second question is, maybe I know half of the answer of the first question, but the second question, you as an intelligence uh, officer, ex-intelligence officer, an expert which we all respect, can you walk us through what is required from, for the United States government to put a, a nice hellfire rocket on his head as soon as possible? Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, uh, so Qasem Soleimani was taken off the joint targeted list back in 2006 and seven. Was taken and off? Taken off, never put back on because we were worried about, we we're fighting Al-Qaeda in Iraq and militias and we didn't want Iran. I, I'm not gonna justify why, just that's, that's okay. what happened. So now, with Qasem Soleimani doing this, uh, one of the pushes now is anytime there's an American flat, American tank with a Qasem Soleimani Quds Force proxy flag flying from it, it's an ISIS tank. It's a piece of, it's a piece of terrorist equipment. Um, there's legislation going through Congress right now to designate Harakat Nujeba, Kitabi Mamali. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that's very good. That's very good. Now, it's, it can't just be sanctions. It can't just be U.S. <laughs> Treasury that does this. It needs to be vetted. But again, and this is something that the Iranians have learned from our response with North Korea. This is a, uh, something that they've learned with our uh, response towards Hezbollah, is that we deal with what are the ramifications of targeting a Qasem Soleimani? What are the ramifications of going after Shia militias? Part of the, part of the thing to secure the Iran deal, uh, Leon Panetta said this, if we go against Iran's strategic interests in Iraq and Syria, the JCPOA would fall apart. We are constrained. Our, our US service members in Iraq are outnumbered by Qasem Soleimani's guys and can be targets. So the ramifications. If I'm an Iranian general, I'm very comfortable. I'm not going to be targeted because if I'm targeted, my guys will kill Americans. They outnumber us 20 to 1 in Iraq. Uh, we, are, we are always looking at the ramifications. So North Korea, if we strike North Korea, what do they do to South Korea? If we strike Iran, what does Hezbollah do to Israel? There's, that's the issue, the second and third order effects of targeting a general. Well, you don't have to have linkage directly to the United States if any of this happens. Um, these, are, these are just simple things that we, we can't say as Americans, but every other foreign intelligence service will say, let's have somebody else do it. Same you know, it's, it's, it's a simple. Was, it, was What's that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the best, the best uh, opportunity for those things to happen, the, the, the number of IRGC generals that have been killed in Syria and killed in Iraq by snipers, that, that's happened. Qasem Soleimani was, was rumored to be injured uh, a year and a half ago. Um, you know, and then there were, there were rumors circulating, and again, my, my Kurdish friends, don't send me anything that's fake that I can Google search and, 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 and show that it's not actual. I, I get it. I hear what you're saying. We should be as outraged about a photo that's a year and a half old as one that was taken yesterday. The problem is our media operates on a, this is t two years ago, um, is uh, the, the fact that you, you can simply, you know, the rumor was that Abu Mehdi al was killed by a, a Peshmerga sniper. Those things will not be frowned upon by the United States if any of that stuff happens. But the United States will not conduct a joint special operations mission to go after Qasem Soleimani. Even though we went after Case Kazali, even though we went after Mohandas, even though we went after Doc Duke and Leith Kazali and Haji Shibul and Akram al Kabi, we went after every one of those IRC Quds Force lieutenants uh, with 
U.S. intelligence and U.S. special operations forces. This mission is, is, is different from what we did in Iraq during the surge. We went after al-Qaeda and Shia militias. Now we're actually providing air cover to a heavily infiltrated security force dominated by Shia militias with ties to Iran to go after a Sunni population and call it a war against ISIS. So it, it, that's, that's the issue. So as these things progress, you, you, have, you have Iraqi militias being designated as terrorist organizations, a huge step. The next part would be, hey, can we put any of these guys on the joint targeting list? And what are the ramifications? Sadr, Muqtada al-Sadr was on the joint targeting list for a minute and said, no, if we do this, we have 10,000 guys from Sadr City that would kill Americans. That is one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people now will say that he should have been taken out a while back. But again, Muqtada al-Sadr is not the problem now. He's been uh, pushed aside by Iran. He's, he's just looking for a paycheck. He'll do something, he'll get paid off, then he goes away. He'll be summoned to Tehran and told to be quiet. These are not issues. Again, don't be confused by um, uh, Saudi investment in Iran. Remember, Saudis have invested in Lebanon, and Iran's always been okay with that as long as nothing the Saudis do keeps Iran from doing things militarily. And that'll be the same, the same contract in, in Iraq. Uh, and that's that's uh, you know, the situation. Thank you. Thanks for the lot of specific information. Uh, you, you mentioned that the Kurdish people are burned by being abandoned by the United States on October 25. So what are your Kurdish contacts telling you about uh, alternatives, uh, or alternatives to allies to the United States? Like, if they were to look at uh, Russian influence or you know, Russian right. help, what could they ask for that would be subtle? What could they ask for that would be overt? Uh, what could they get, uh, assuming that the United States presence remains a what it is well, well, Putin's already exploited this schism. Putin's already engaged in the KRG and the PUK and the KDP. He's smart. Qasem Soleimani has, has inroads into Goran and has inroads into the PUK and now has somebody that they believe they can work with out of the, the PUK. I'm sorry, the KDP. Uh, these are even hardened Sunni anti-Baghdad, anti-Shia sectarians told me in Ramadi that Iran has, is the biggest tribe now, so we will work with Iran. We have no choice. There's this strong tribe concept just works. It doesn't matter. If sectarianism was a principal position, you wouldn't be able to get a car bomb through a Shia checkpoint, through Shia neighborhoods, to target a Shia area. Sectarianism, unfortunately, is not a principal, I mean, fortunately, is not a principal position. But again, you know, you can pay somebody at a checkpoint 200 bucks to get a car bomb through when everybody at the checkpoint knows it's a car bomb because I'm not willing to die for, for this. And that's, 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 a, that's a, a macro look at, at this, this situation. So what do the Kurds ask for? Well, Congress just said we're going to directly arm uh, and send funds to the KRG now and not go through Baghdad. So that's a good thing. Our joint special operations mission requires that we base out of our bill to continue to do that. The problem is they've gone to the mattresses. We're on the bases. We're not out. We're not. We're not working with our with our counterparts. We're working with the Iraqi military forces, and not with, you know, Pesh, Peshmerga and Kurds outside of the Iraqi army because the Iraqi army won't let them back in. There are no more Sunni battalions, companies, brigades in the Iraqi military. There are no more Kurdish companies, battalions, brigades in the Iraqi military. Half of the Iraqi military has been decimated. Not decimated, but um, the second, third, and fourth Iraqi army divisions I talked about no longer exist, and there's no effort to build them. Uh, so what do the Kurds ask for? Uh, the Kurds ask for us to do the right thing and don't give up on the US just yet. It's October 25th is when this happened, and uh, there has not been further encroachment. There have been rumored airstrikes against Shia militia positions uh, by, by some 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 allies that that the Kurds have, and uh, those are those are good things. So Baghdad knows that this is a fight they can't take on just yet. The problem is the Kurds. And when I say that when I say the Kurds, I'm talking about Erbil and Dehuk. They're they're now looking at Soleimani as a potential back door for Iranian aggression. Uh, they're looking at other places that they shouldn't have to look. But I get it. I get it. If you if you don't have the United States standing there with you. You have, to, you have to do things. I mean, we came out so heavily against it. This is Ambassador Crocker said this. 
we came out so heavily against a referendum that somehow we gave a green light for a heavy-handed mm -hmm. uh, response. Mm -hmm. This was a vote. This was a vote. This wasn't a binding uh, you know, position that the Kurds took. This was a vote to say, hey, after all of this, we want to decide how to live in a country. And, and you, if you think about it, this is, this is, this is a, you know, Bar Barzani said it best the other day when he was talking to Christiane Amanpour. He said, you know, where, where is the, the world on democracy and, and freedom? It doesn't exist. We have to survive. We have to do this ourselves now. And we have no friends. And I hate to hear an ally say that about the United States. Yes, sir. And the last question. Oh, yeah, sorry about going over there. <laughs> The best of the best questions, but uh, Warren Guns, I was a uh, senior monetary policy advisor to the Central Bank of Iraq in uh, 2005 and 6. Um, thank you for a fascinating and totally uh, depressing story. It, it's all solution based. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> right. it is not new, it is all too common. Right. Uh, Vietnam comes to mind uh, every time we try to take sides in somebody else's civil war on somebody else's territory. We get this kind of story. You you put your finger on a part of it in, in saying that you, know, you spend a year in the Pentagon, you spend a year here, you right. spend a year there. We rotate our guys through right. and, and, and our gals. And, and therefore, nobody becomes a real expert on who the bad guys are this week or who the bad guys were next week. You know, right. we just don't know who we're playing the game with. Right. And the final example was standing where you are now, last month or the month before, was a young lady uh, from Kurdistan uh, who argued convincingly that the uh, referendum was a terrible idea. Uh, first of all, we can't talk about the Kurds as a unified thing any more than we can talk about Iraqis as a unified thing. Right. They, they are internal enemies. They're only working together because they have a common expert right. enemy at the moment. And she thought it was awful. Uh, you know, that the current administration there was simply perpetuating an illegal rule, having suspended elections for a long time, and she was against it. So good people like yourself and her can be on opposite sides, right? Uh, very genuinely and sincerely. And why do we think we know enough about these foreign places to send our young people out there to take sides and die? I will never understand. Well, well we, we, we should know based on our history, based on simply looking at the successes of successes and failures. And we're so afraid of our failures that we repeat them. <laughs> we're, we're so afraid of, of using our successes that we shelve them. And, and I don't understand it because, um, you know, in Afghanistan, we've been there for 17 years, and I would say we've been there. 17 times for one-year deployments. We, we run the Afghanistan campaign like, like uh, Dan Schneider runs the Redskins, trying to win every year with a different team, <laughs> and it just doesn't work. Um, going back to your point about where you worked uh, in Iraq and what sector you worked in, um, we can now sanction the Iraqi government, and goes back to your question, sanction Iraqi oil companies for working with the Iranians through the IRGC. So there are tools, but will we use those tools? Well, we'd be afraid to use those tools. Um, going back to good people being on opposite sides of an issue, I find myself on the opposite side of these issues because of these two simple things. I don't believe that there is a rule of law in Iraq. I believe that the Constitution is used when it benefits somebody and it's shelved when it doesn't. And that, that, that party in power is always able to decide how it's used. Um, when I argue with, with colleagues about the Iraqi military, they show me line and block charts. They show me things on paper that say that this is what the Iraqi army is. I was in the Iraqi army as an advisor. And again, uh, you know, I was a first iteration advisor and I know that a line and block chart is a line and block chart. And when you have a 50% manning of a unit on the ground, it's not reflected in a line and block chart. Anybody know what a line and block chart is? 
So basically, you know, this is what the division looks like. Um, people that I argue with about this, and I said, I, I want to, I want to have my mind changed. I believe that good people can be on the wrong, different sides of an issue. But I also believe good people should look at the reality on the ground. And the reality on the ground is, Iraq, Iraq's military is not what the line and block charts say, and Iraq's constitution uh, is being selectively used because there is no rule of law in Iraq. And we should know that. It goes back to your point. Why do we think we know more about these countries than people in them? And there's a thing in Arabic, and I'm probably saying this wrong, but I would always tell people, Lazam shuf al mushkila min ayunkum. I have to look at the problems through your eyes. And it worked with some people, and then a tribal sheikh said, who are you to look through my eyes? You're not even the same. <laughs> I'm like, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> but, but there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that we can learn from our, from our history that we don't apply. Uh, one of the biggest questions, real quick, in Baghdad after ISIS came in are, where are all the Americans we worked with during the surge when we got this right? Nobody showed up. And then the Daily Beast, I'm a contributor writer for, uh, one of my colleagues said, there's too many generals in Iraq. There's more generals than troops in Iraq if you look at what generals are supposed to be in charge of. That's because the generals that were there were lieutenant colonels and majors during the surge. And they knew Iraq. And they were there to, to, to bridge that, that uh, generation gap we had between current American advisors and the Iraqis. The Iraqis were always in an advantage. I was a first iteration advisor. By the end of the Iraq war, they saw 12 of me. Um, 12 different levels of dedication, 12 different levels of knowledge, each with a different goal, some that didn't want to be there, and the guy across from you is the same guy. And they develop a playbook, and they're chess players, and it's easy to do. Now, I, ho I, I sounded negative, <laughs> but there are solutions in everything. That I, that I talked about here. It's a dire situation with very simple fixes. Acknowledge the issue, don't ignore it, and use your levers. Use smart power, hard power, soft power allies. Regional allies, local allies. I'm not a fan of using regional allies in Iraq because Iraqis are very proud. Use your Sunni population. One of the things that I was uh, felt inspired by when General Mattis, McMaster, and Flynn were going into the, the administration, uh, worked for all of them. Uh, General Flynn is a lieutenant, Mattis is a civilian, and uh, McMaster is a DIA intelligence uh, officer. And each said, you can't defeat a Sunni insurgency without Sunni manpower and Sunni intelligence from the local cities, <laughs> meaning Sunni Arab or Sunni Kurds. We haven't done that. In, we didn't do that in Syria. We haven't done that in Iraq. And we're about to declare victory. And when we declare victory, Iran's going to you know, clean champagne glasses if they, if they, if they drink. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. But there are solutions in every time. Thank you for coming. Please join us in two weeks for even more. Thank you. Thank you.